it's all coming out today. Hi guys, how you doing? Nick Jennison, Guitar Interactive, GI+. Plus. It's Monday, we're doing the thing that we do on Mondays, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. And today we are continuing our discussion on, ooh, I guess you could call it sounds that maybe don't really belong in the blues, but work really, really great in the blues with some discussion of diminished scales. Now, the last two weeks we've discussed the use of melodic minor and how you can use it to augment, pardon the pun, your uh, blues playing make you sound kind of more interesting, more ear catching, give you some dangerous ways to spice up your blues. Well, today we're dipping our toes into even more deadly waters with the diminished scales. There are two of them. We're going to talk about them at length in this stream, but it's not going to be as jazz as you might think. It's a really cool way that you can spice up your blues with a very easy fingering very symmetrical fingering uh, that kind of bears moving around the fretboard in an interesting way. So we're going to get into that, but before we do, a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, if you're joining us for the first time, thanks for coming on board. My name is Nick Jennison, Guitar Interactive, GI+. Plus. GI Plus, says so in this corner, I'll point you the right corner one of these days. There we go, GI Plus, this is where you can go to get more lessons that are in the vein of the one we're discussing today, but in huge detail, but not just on this topic, on all manner of topics, including, but not limited to, jazz, metal, fusion, country, shred. We got some beginner stuff, we got acoustic stuff, we got Sam Bell, we've got Rick Graham, we got Tom Quayle, we've got uh, Michelangelo Badio, we've got Manelli Jamal, we have Andy Wood, Andy James, uh, I did some too, Lewis Turner, uh, Ian Simo, uh, who else do we have? You name it. Uh, loves and loves great guitar players. Don Alder, um, Michael Caswell, me too. I did some lessons as well. Did a whole bunch of lessons. If you want said lessons, go to this URL down here, guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus that's the word plus p l u s or click the link down below where you can go and get all those lessons also a couple of ways you can help us keep the lights on we've gone with purple lights today apologies if i'm looking a little bit dark today i've had a light fail on me over at this side which is normally casting a glow on my hair today i'm just blending with the backdrop but that's okay it's the guitar that counts and you guys can see the guitar which is fine so yeah you want to help me uh keep the lights on then uh you can do the following you can go to that url or you can give us a thumbs up on whatever platform you happen to be watching this on you can share this with your guitar playing buddies because we'd like to reach as many guitar players as we possibly can also you can drop us a comment because the algorithm loves comments but more importantly i love comments because we're going to be answering your questions at the 45 minute mark so if you've got a question at any point in today's stream about this or about anything else for that matter Drop me a comment below. Let's keep it guitar related. But uh, even still, you know, we'll, we'll not get into uh, the weeds too much in that. But speaking of comments, let's check in with the comments section and see how everyone's getting on. We got all sorts of fun to be had with this sort of stuff today. But first of all, we have some discussion on a Zach Wild Les Paul from our friend Marcy. And I'm going to highlight this one first. This is Daryl Queen, who was first in the house. Uh, Daryl's one of our returning streamers. Always good crack. Always good to have Daryl on board. Uh, says, hey Nick, everyone, hope you're well. Diminished scales and blues, or how to cop that Robin Ford thing in three easy steps. We could have clickbaited it, but we didn't. Uh, lol, looking forward to this. Me too, my man, me too. So it is that, but there's also some other ways that you can kind of get into the uh, the diminished scale thing. So if you are already au fait with what some people would refer to as the Robin Ford trick with the diminished scale where we use it... Um, to create a, uh, let's call it a five alt at one movement where there isn't one. If you, if you go on like, what the hell do these numbers mean? Don't worry. Uh, if you're already a fan with that, we've got some other interesting uses for this too. But if you've never even heard of diminished scales, don't worry, we got your back because we're going to show you all about it today. Um, but that is a very cool trick. It's often associated with Robin Ford for good reason. Uh, Marcin anyway, Marcin is in the house. He is one of our uh, longest standing and um, like most beloved streamers. Marcin has been with us since pretty much day one. Great guitar player and getting better all the time, which is enthusing and terrifying to see all at the same time. No, that's good. It's a good crack. Marcin is really, really upping his game week on week. Love seeing the videos he's posting with his band on Instagram. It's always really, really cool stuff. Uh, it says, hello, Nick. Hi, everyone. Last week I played Gibson LP Zach Wilde. And let me tell you, it was worth the ridiculous price. Shame uh, it mostly goes to collectors now. This axe wants to be played. I've never played one of 
the Gibson ones, but what I've heard is that they are absolutely stunning. I've, even, I've played a bunch of the Epiphone ones, and they're great. They're really, really good guitars, but we know there's a difference. We know there's a big difference there. So I can well believe. Daryl Queen's jealous. I'm jealous too. Uh, I have an Epi version, and it's surprisingly good guitar for the price point. Can concur. Gets a lot of hate because of the, um, the EMG thing. I don't think that's warranted. Pardon me, I had to cough there. Um, I don't think the EMG hate is warranted. Uh, I think some people kind of dunk on active pickups without really... I think they dunk on the idea of active pickups more than the reality of them. You guys know I'm a Fisherman Fluence fan. Don't have Fluences in this guitar today. You know I'm a fan of the Fluences. Um, not really a modern guy, but I like the DTs an awful lot, and they have an EMG-inspired voice in voice form, which always sounds killer. Uh, Timothy Appling's in the house. Timothy, a hoy neck and fellow guitarist. Uh, guitarist, ahoy to you too, Timothy. Good to see you. Uh, Marcin says that sounds great. Was it a bullseye or another design? It was in fact bullseye. Uh, never heard EMG sounding so good. Well, you know what, man? Who would have thought it? Who would have thought it? And everybody said that EMGs just make the guitar sound exactly the same, no matter what you put them in. There you go. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. It's almost like the guitar is a system and the uh, pickups are not the entirety of the sound. Uh, but we'll get to that. That's another topic for another day. We'll maybe talk about that later. How much do pickups matter? I'll have to grab a few different guitars for that, but that's something we'll be able to set up soon. Uh, Sacred Godslayer is in the house. Good to have you back, my man. Uh, glad you could join us. Foghorn is in the house. Uh, last three weeks' lessons have been awesome. Been learning a ton of stuff. Hey, man, thank you very much. I'm pleased you said that. Very, very kind of you to say. Had an epizac while bull I myself for about a week and got rid very very heavy axe that is true if you know there's a lot of maple uh, in those guitars maple's quite a heavy wood so you know if you want to you want to like guitar that's probably not the place to go myself I've never been that bothered about the weight of a guitar but maybe it'll catch up with me one day who knows uh, PJ says uh, I'll never be first through the door when I'm thinking it's Sunday it does feel like Sunday for you guys who aren't in the UK it's a bank holiday here in the UK uh, and bank holiday Mondays always feel like Sunday days um one of those things i've been to a wedding this weekend and it's been absolutely fantastic but yeah i know what you mean it feels like a sunday today um we got some discussion on emgs uh we'll come back to that in just a bit but marcin's friend who has the guitar has a boutique guitar store and coffee shop in one place does he need somebody to move in with him because uh but yeah, I fancy that gig. That does sound pretty damn cool. Uh, we also have some uh, condolences for the sad passing of Bernie Marsden, uh, for sure. That came as a big shock, man. Um, Bernie was, I'm sure we can all agree, one of the, uh, the all-time greats. Some of the songs he wrote, some of the incredible tasteful solos uh, that he played, not just with White Snake, but with a whole bunch of other projects. Oh, we got some love for the UFO stuff. Very cool, very, very nice. It's a real tragic shame. Um, to, you know, the Mars the Moody era uh, of White Snake is uh, the stuff of legend, especially around here in the Northeast. Um, I feel like it's. Uh, it's something that, you know, like a lot of my, my peers growing up, let's say, guitar players who are a bit older than me would, you know, kind of insist on, you've got to check this out, right? You think that John Sykes stuff is cool. It is cool, but you've got to check out the uh, Moody Marsden era, and I can totally agree. Um, so, yeah, real, real tragic loss. Um, great guitar player and apparently a really nice guy. I only met Bernie very, very briefly once uh, in Los Angeles airport, which is not a good place to meet anyone. So I kind of left him alone. I was like, hi, Bernie. It's great to meet you. And then off I, off I trotted. Um, but he did seem very pleasant. Um, but anyway, so we got some, yeah, some love for Bernie Mars. And also, uh, Cranky Tom, who is another returning streamer. Great to have you back, my man. Uh, says, Marcin, I trust you've checked out the Zach Wild Tech Session. If you haven't checked out the Zach Wild Tech Session, maybe I'll show you guys in a bit. If you're interested in learning the Zach thing, we've got a tech session where we show you how to do the Zach thing. I'll show you the performance in a wee little bit. Um, so a lot of love for Zach. Uh, Steve Ford is in the house. Hi, Steve. Great to see you. Steve McD is here, too. Uh, David Yates is in the house. Uh, says, very sad about Bernie. I uh, saw so him opening the bill at Nebworth Fair in Alaska, with Alaska rather, in Alaska, with Alaska in 1985 when Deep Purple headlined. Uh, as far as uh, EMGs, surprisingly, Nofla liked them. I prefer Passive. You know, Nofla liked them. Um, David Gilmore used them for a very long time. Steve Lukather sounded pretty good with EMGs. Um, I think we can all agree. I think Holdsworth 
had a little dalliance with EMGs as well. So, you know, just saying, James Hetfield sounds pretty hot with him too. Um, it's, yeah, one of those things. So don't forget, by the way, don't forget, don't forget, got a question, drop it in uh, tech comments. Now, this is Jonathan typing excitedly because he's just come off the phone uh, with Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters. You can expect to see that interview in uh, an upcoming edition of Guitar Interactive magazine. It's going to be good, right? John has uh, already shouted about it on social media, and I know when John shouts about something when he comes off the phone, it's going to be a good one. We've also got some really cool coverage from the Keeping the Blues Alive at Sea cruise coming for you. Uh, so you got any... Uh, if you want to know how that went down or, you know, you want to see some interviews with some of those artists, we've got it coming. So don't forget, subscribe to us on YouTube. You can get all of the latest guitar news, gear stuff, lessons, all that stuff first. Uh, next, Corsair S1 Tips, who was in with some fantastic theory observations last week, has said half all diminished is a great tool to get more interesting tones. You'll find it mainly, you'll find mainly dominant seven, or many rather, sorry, you'll find many dominant seven chords within it. You will, but you'll also find uh, minor chords, you'll find diminished chords. It's a really interesting scale because of its symmetrical nature. But yeah, you'll find a lot of dominant seven uh, chords within that are useful for blues. We're gonna get onto that. So good observation, my man, good observation. Um, who else do we have? A very couple of very quick comments before we get into it. Uh, Timothy Appling says, uh, hi Nick, I see the Quad Cortex has had a large firmware update recently. I know you're a quad man, so give us your opinion on the update later. I've been keeping up with the effects model and use. I will have to give you that next week because I haven't done the update yet. Um, been away, haven't been gigging. The Cortex mainly comes out live for me so um if i don't have any shows uh for a few weeks it just goes into storage uh for a little bit to make more room in my little studio um so yeah got some other stuff here this is a cool one uh from cowcat problem is you get addicted to that sound and you don't want to go back to non-altered sounds well we're going to show you how you can actually use this to leverage some non all that sounds let's say let's say um who else do we have um oh we got some uh some comments on the beast yeah bernie's legendary les paul glad the beast stayed with him until the end totally agree uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that guitar uh, if that makes sense. Great comment from Russia. I don't read Cyrillic, so I can't pronounce that name, but uh, hello from Russia. Could you say, uh, do you use diminished scale on Dorian Minor or on other music frets? Well, all will become clear. We're gonna try and highlight that as we go on. So stick with us, because we got some stuff for you guys. So anyway, listen, that was a very long discussion in the comment section. We're gonna come back to you guys later. If you have uh, questions, you have comments, don't forget, drop them down below. So let's get into the meat of uh, today's session. First of all, we're going to discuss some terms. What do we mean by diminished scale? So, few things, a uh, few ways we could kind of discuss the, the diminished scale thing. Now, one common misconception is that people uh, I've spoken to in the past have confused the diminished scale with the Locrian mode. Not the same thing. Now, the Locrian mode is what we get when we play on the seventh degree of a major scale. So if we're playing C major, for example, if we played the notes of C major, but over a B diminished chord, we would get B Locrian. It would be this kind of sound right here. interesting sound it's not the diminished scale it is a scale that has a half diminished uh, chord nested within it so don't worry we're not getting into Locrian today that's another story from the day other things people will uh, sometimes confuse diminished scales with they'll confuse it with diminished arpeggios now diminished arpeggios are part of the battle when it comes to diminished scales but this might be something if you've heard uh, Ingvar Malmsteen talk about this stuff for example maybe he's talked about the diminished scale thing where he'll talk about the Let's see, the A harmonic minor. And how it contains within it this. Now that's a diminished seventh arpeggio. Now we've talked about this in the past, not the same thing as a diminished scale, but let's begin by outlining what that is, because that's gonna be an interesting framework that we can use to build ourselves a diminished scale. So first of all, the diminished arpeggio 
is what you might think of as a symmetrical scale or a symmetrical arpeggio, symmetrical musical device, regardless. So what do we mean by symmetrical? Well, symmetrical refers to the uh, the intervals contained within. And for this, I'm gonna show you it up the E string. Now, don't worry, the theory is not gonna to get too dense as we go on, but it's important to discuss these terms. So very quickly, if I was to play for you on the high E string, an E arpeggio, I would get E, G sharp, B, and then a high E, up here. Notice the gaps between my fingers. We have like three frets here that are empty. We have two empty frets here. We have like four empty frets here. We could realistically call this symmetrical. It sounds good, but it's not symmetrical. So what if I was to play an E and a B flat? Just E's and B flats. Sounds a bit unsettling, but it is symmetrical. Now, what do we mean by symmetrical? Well, if you have a look at the number of frets between my open string and my middle finger, we have one, two, three, four, five open frets. Uh, by open frets, I mean frets that are not playing, frets that don't have fingers on them. Here, we have one, two, three, four, five other open frets between the 12th fret and this sixth fret note here. So even though this sounds a bit weird and wonderful and a bit sort of like uh, eerie, I guess, the probably way of putting it, this is what we'd refer to as a symmetrical musical device because the distance between this note and this note and the distance between this note and this note are the same. Not the same if we do a fifth. There's a shorter distance here than there is here, for example. Now, diminished seventh uh, arpeggios are what we'd refer to as a symmetrical scale made of stacked minor thirds. What do we mean by this? What do we mean by this? Um, yeah, we're, we're getting to that. Don't worry, don't worry. Go with me, it's coming. So, okay, we're gonna start with the E once again. Symmetrical scales, symmetrical scales. So we have an E. If we move a minor third or three frets up from our open E, we have E, we can go to this G sharp. That's an interval of three frets, or a minor third. One, two, three. If we go up another three frets, one, two, three, we have the same interval here that we have here. That's the same. If we then take the same interval, which is here, and then we add the 12th fret in on top, which is here, even though this sounds A bit spooky, I guess, you would consider this to be symmetrical. Symmetrical. Why? Because the distance between all of the notes is the same. That's what we refer to as a diminished seven arpeggio. Now, it's an interesting thing to observe before we go any further. Here's just a bit of fun because music might be the only form of art where symmetry isn't nice where, you know, if we think about like aesthetics, if we think about drawing things or painting things or sculpting, symmetry, we like. We like symmetry in the way humans look. We like humans that are symmetrical. We consider them to be to be beautiful, etc. cetera. Uh, we like symmetry in um, things like the written word. We like symmetry in, in poetry and prose. We don't like symmetry in music because it sounds like this. It's a cool sound, but it's not what you'd call a pretty sound, let's say. It's kind of an unsettling sound. Now, here's a way that we can use diminished arpeggios and the way we can finger it easily to use in the context of our blues. So let's do a fingering for this real quick. So we're gonna be playing the key of A very quickly. Let's start with the A minor pentatonic. So A minor pentatonic is here. We have five, with the fifth fret, we're gonna get eight five, eight five, Seven five, seven five, seven five, eight five. Let's take the highest two notes. Well, what interval do we have here? That's the same interval that we found in our diminished arpeggio. It's this minor third interval. So if we keep stacking that, if we keep stacking this up and down, we can turn this into a diminished seventh arpeggio. So what do we get out of that? Well, we get this. So if we play these two notes and we look for a minor third down, we get this F sharp note, 
which we could put here. So we can get this. Now what we have thus far is, in this case, fret number eight on the high E string, and then fret number five on the high E string, fret number seven on the B string. We got this, we got this, okay, there we go. Now, if we stacked another minor third underneath, we'd get this. This note, in this instance, well, there's a few ways you could spell it. We're gonna spell it as an E flat for today. It could be a D sharp. Depends how you wanna, you wanna think about this, but we're gonna spell it as an E flat because of the way it relates to our scale. Now, we could play it here, but we'd be just as well playing it here. Interesting. So what we have is eight, five, seven, and then eight. And then we can finish it with five on the G string. How do we know? Because it's one octave away from our first note. So we have this shape. Useful if you want to be in via Malmsteen, sure, right? If you want to play... Uh... So on and so forth. Useful, but also useful in the blues. Let me show you. So, first of all, check this out. If I play my A minor pentatonic, watch this. Did you catch that? That was a diminished scale, a diminished arpeggio over the four chord. It sounds pretty nice. We'll get back to that in a second. Watch this. Another example of a cheeky little diminished arpeggio thrown in there, but we're not here to talk about diminished arpeggios. We're here to talk about diminished scales. And diminished scales are another symmetrical idea along the lines of our diminished arpeggio another symmetrical idea, but in this case, there is a symmetrical idea that comes in the form of semitones and tones. Now, there are two diminished scales out there. We're going to focus on one of them that we're going to refer to as the half-whole diminished scale. Let me show you what it means. Half-whole diminished is a scale that's made of half notes and, surprise, surprise, whole notes. And the way we stack them is we stack a semitone and then we stack a tone. And then our next interval is to stack a semitone, and then we stack a tone. Then we stack a semitone, then we stack a tone, then we stack a semitone, then we stack a tone. Now, this is why we call it half whole diminished. You could think about it as two diminished arpeggios next to each other. So you could think about it as A diminished and B flat diminished, like this. <laughs> Interesting sound, it kind of has hints of that kind of bluesy mixed lady new familiarity in there because it does contain these notes, which is the dominant seven chord, but it also contains a bunch of weird and cool stuff too that we're gonna get to. Now, let me start by showing you a few easy ways that we could finger this. Now, not only is this a symmetrical scale in terms of the, the way we play it, it's also a symmetrical fingering. So let me show you an easy fingering that is based around the A minor pentatonic scale. Now, the fingering is gonna go thus. If we put finger number one and we place it on fret number five, ready to play our A minor pentatonic, what we could play is this. We could play fingers four, two, one, which would give us frets eight, six, and five. And then we could play frets eight, seven, and five with fingers four, three, one. So four, two, one, four, three, one. And here's a bit of fun. We could also then do the same thing, exactly the same fingering, on the next two strings. Now, we're going to use this in the context of a blues in just a second, but that's our diminished scale spelled out in one position. But I'm also showing you some other stuff that we can do uh, 
in terms of moving it around and all that sort of thing. We'll get to that as well. But one quick reminder, what we get here is starting on the eighth fret with our pinky finger, we get fingers four, two, one, or frets eight, six, five. And then once again, on the B string, fingers four, three, one, or frets eight, seven, five. I'll play for you one more time. And then exactly the same thing, but starting on the G string. Frets eight, six, five, eight, seven, five. Now, in terms of phrasing, the way we're going to begin this is we're going to begin by just running the scale. Right, so you'll hear it doesn't sound terribly phrasy and terribly interesting just yet, but it's just an example of how we might use it. And the position we're going to begin by using it is in the classic Robin Ford position, where we play it on bar number four. Now, trust me on this. If we play it in bar number four of our blues, just before we go from A to D7, we're going to get something interesting. And I'll explain why once we've done it. But first, grab your guitars. We're going to do this together. So I'm going to play this. Obviously, this time, so I'll shout out when I'm about to do this. So, if I go here, here it comes. Up the resolution there, but I'll do it once more just to show you what's going on. And then what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to give you some space to play it. So grab your guitars, you're going to need them. I'm going to go like this. Here it comes. Now, again, we're just running the scale at this point. We can phrase it in a much more musical fashion, but we'll get to that in a second. So, what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you a quick second to play. You're going to start an A minor pentatonic, and then you're going to throw this in on bar number four. So let's try it together. All right, your turn. A minor pentatonic. A minor pentatonic. Let's do the half hold here. And then back out to A minor pentatonic. Let's do it once again. I'm going to give you a quick second. So I'll play for a bit. Half hole here, and back out here. There we go. Nice. So what you can hear there is we get this very cool outside kind of sound that feels quite natural at that point in the blues. Let's talk about why for just a second. Now, here's an interesting thing with this, right? What we can do with a dominant blues that we're playing here, so dominant blues, dominant blues, we can treat these dominant chords as one of two things. We can either treat them as what we refer to as static dominant, and the static dominant is something that doesn't really tolerate being played on outside, let's say. It, you can do it, but it doesn't like it very much. It kind of rebels against you. Um, we can also treat them as what we refer to as functional dominance. Now, when we play blues, nine times out of ten, we're playing these chords as static dominance. So you don't even need to worry about what they are. The way you would play over that, you play minor pentatonic, you play mixed Lydian. If you're feeling really adventurous, you play Lydian dominant, but not in a blues. You play minor major pentatonics, you play mixed Lydian, you play all of the good blues stuff that we play all the time. We can also treat them as functional dominance, but only in some occasions. Now, what's a functional dominant? Well, a functional dominant is when we find a dominant chord that is resolving to another chord a fifth away. Now in this case, we have an A dominant that's moving to D. Now if I play a D power chord, which is right here, we can see that the fifth of D is A. So in this case, this move, While we know that it's chord one going to chord four, we can treat it as 
chord five going to chord one, but in a new key for a moment, in the key of D. Gives you a really interesting way to manoeuvre through that change. It's very, very cool. Now, the reason the half all diminished works in this context is the half all diminished includes a lot of the tones that make a diminished scale, uh, sorry, make a, a functional dominant into an altered dominant. Now, altered dominants we talked about before, but it's where we sharpen or flatten the third, sorry, say that again, sharpen or flatten the ninth and sharpen or flatten the fifth. And this scale contains pretty much all of them. It's very, very cool. Now, let's talk about some other potential usages for this, because there's some other stuff we can do apart from just the Robin Ford trick. Now, here's a bit of fun. First of all, have you ever seen this lick where Stevie Ray Vaughan will do this? <laughs> This right here this move right here where we play this A to A flat and back again for all this probably not what Stevie was thinking of is at its heart a half hole diminished scale line now what's really cool about this is we can actually take this line and can kind of like intellectualize it as a half hole diminished lick. So what have we got? We've got this note, which starts in a D that's not in our half hole diminished scale. But we're very quickly bending it up to an E, which is in the half hole diminished scale. That's in there. That's in. That's in our scale. That's in our scale. That's in our scale too. So if we play this. We do something we hear Stevie do, or we heard Stevie do quite a lot. It's a very cool lick. Um, it's really a half all diminished lick, which is pretty cool because it has some connotations that we can use when it's time to start shifting things around. And we'll get to that in a second, but it, it doesn't sound like this. It, it, that sounds very, very like, willfully outside, but if we play it here, right there that sounds very bluesy it still sounds like we're playing blues it just doesn't it, it also has this cool outside kind of vibe to it let's say because what we've got is we've got this same deal that's come from our half all diminished but we're just playing it in this Stevie Ray Vaughan-esque kind of fashion which is very cool so let me show you the lick real quick you can phrase the lick however you want but the way I would play it is I'm gonna play that good old-fashioned seven to nine bends play again so we're bending here from seven to nine on the G string five to eight on the B string bit of a wee bend there. We go to five on the high E string like this. We once again do the, the eighth fret and then we pull off. But here with our pull off, do a very quick hammer on and pull off again from five to six. Hendrix this, we can play it however we want, but that's really cool. Because it sounds like blues. Now, another way we can make this even more half all diminished is if we took this note and subbed it out for this note here. Loads of fun. Now, we could really get into the weeds with this, but let me show you a fun trick with these licks that we can use when it's time to play this half all diminished thing and how we can make it even more kind of 
oh, I guess even more sort of outside. I'm going to show you a very fun way of doing this with some bluesy kind of flourishes. So if you have that lick on your fingers or any blues lick that you can think that you can kind of throw some of these half all diminished things in, I'm going to show you some, uh, some other stuff here. So real quick. <laughs> back to our half hole diminished scale. We go back to this fingering that we discussed, right? There's our A. We can attach this series of endings. We don't need to worry about what they are yet. We'll get back to that, but we can attach this series of intervals to this A. Because these scales are symmetrical, they repeat every three frets. So the fingering here and the fingering here exactly the same and the fingering here exactly the same fingering here exactly the same right so here we have our a half all diminished if we play c half all diminished it's exactly the same as a play E flat exactly the same as A. If we play, it would be G double flat. We're going to call it F sharp, right? Uh, oh no, it would just be G flat. Just be G flat. We'll call it F sharp in this case. Whatever. Uh, we get this. Now, I'm saying F sharp because, yes, that's not the right spelling, but I'm saying it because that's what's relative to our home key. We have an F sharp in this home key. We don't have a G flat. We already have a G. So there's reasons. Don't don't come after me, right? I know what I'm, I know what I'm saying here. I, I promise. So anyway, with that in mind, if we take this lick, this Stevie Ray lick, we can play that. On an A, on a C, on an E flat, in that four, in that fourth bar of our blues. Watch this, right? This is really good fun. time because I'm actually resolving this E flat down to D in that fourth chord and it still kind of sounds like a blues lick so it doesn't really sound too out there it does sound out there but but that sounds pretty cool to my ear. Now, here's a fun thing, right? If we literally just take the minor pentatonic scale and we do our best not to hit, if we do our best not to hit the fourth, which would be here on its own. We can do that. That's definitely a half all diminished. It, it exists in the half all diminished scale, and if we start moving it by three fret intervals, watch this. Check that out in this fourth bar. Just the blue scale. Here it goes. We're smart and we resolve it we've got something really freaking cool there now what if we would take this a little step further and what if we would take this into the context of a minor blues now minor blues is something that we don't really um that is voice leading says uh nick's corsair s1 tips i don't know if you're referring to that particular thing we're doing there i mean it kind of is because we're kind of getting from uh this uh e flat dominant sound through to this D dominant sound, this move from there to there, 
it sort of is. It, I would kind of consider it more of a tritone substitution thing because I'm not really probably talking about something else. Uh, we've got some, we've got like a theory lecture going on in the comments. So uh, all of which is true, by the way. I should say he's not wrong. Um, but I'm like, mm, okay, yeah, it's cool. You, there is, all of this is absolutely true. Um, but whether it's the right order to, to, to chat about it in is a different story. But we'll get to that. I mean, that's just my opinion. So anyway, minor blues. Here's a fun thing, right? So we'll go to C minor very quickly. We talked about this a lot and we talked about a melodic minor stuff. Can we do the same trick in minor blues on the fourth bar? Yes. Why? Because... <laughs> because we're playing a minor 7 chord or a minor 6 chord which would be this or this or this for example all of those are represented in our half hole diminished so we can get this chords too. Which were these tricksy sounding A flat and G uh, dominant chords. What can we play over that? Well, imagine that. We can play A flat and then G half all diminished. Literally the same fingering. Watch this. Now where I'm going to get them, here's an A flat, here's a G. Watch this. Loads of fun. Now, we talked last week about how we could use melodic minor to get around those. They're very, very cool. But we could just use this half all diminished thing and we could get through that too. So places we can deploy it, we can deploy it on bar number four by playing C half all diminished. You wouldn't think that because you'd be like, what's well, a minor chord? Can I not? Half all diminished implies dominant. Well, it does, but it also implies minor because it has a minor third in it and it has a minor seven in it. It has a natural six, so we could play, it could be minor six. It could be, it could be major six. It could be, uh, <laughs> it could be a dominant 13 if it wanted to be. Um, lots of possibilities with this scale. It's a really, really fun scale when you start digging into all the stuff that's in there. But I guess the easy way to get around it, like I say, take the fingering and just deploy it and you'll find some cool stuff within it. Now, places we can deploy this. Let's just go back over that very, very quickly. We can play, we're playing in C. We can play uh, C, half all diminished. We can play it here. To get from the one chord to the four chord. We could also play A flat and then G, but watch this. Take a close look at this, right? Here's A flat. Where's our nearest C? It's there. Could we play a semitone down? Like this. Up that A flat? Yes, we could. Watch this. I'll play the right one, will I? there if we wanted to continue onto a G7 altered we could play this one we could play B we could play B flat a semitone down then a semitone down again let me show you watch this watch me try not to exit this position Semitone down. Again. Now, this is getting quite jazz-tastic, but that's okay because you don't have to do this all the time. You don't even have to use the whole scale. You can just pick a note from it and then you've got 
some fun to be had. Let me pick one note out of this half all diminished. I'm going to pick this note. Literally just that note. And we'll get that altered effect. Watch this. Simple. Here I'm going to pick this note. And away we go. Now, personally, I feel like the best way to get your ear around this is to exaggerate it. So go all in with this stuff. Go all in with this stuff like literally throw the whole kitchen sink scale at it and then what you'll gradually be able to do is you'll gradually be able to make it a little more subtle the more you play with it and you'll be able to blend this into your playing with a bit more subtlety and all that sort of stuff so anyway listen before we go any further just want to take a quick opportunity to first of all thank you for sticking with me on that uh I guess that kind of ramble about uh, <laughs> that ramble about the um, the wonders of the half all diminished scale. If you're after something a little bit more accessible, let's say, and you want to start getting into some scales that are beyond the pentatonic scale, you can check out this great course that we have in GI Plus, guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus plus the word this is mastering modes part one it's a real easy look at how you can take the pentatonic scale and with the addition of just a handful of notes you can start to dip your toes into this modal thing now this is not a mode particularly that we're playing today it's a little bit further on than that but if you're sat going geez i know the pentatonic but i don't know where to go from there this is something i'd love to get into but it's a little bit over my head right now don't worry about that we've got a great course for you check it out this is mastering modes part one and when we come back we're going to be answering your questions so if you have questions, drop them down below. Let's uh, let's get into it. This is Mastering Modes Part One. Modes. What are modes? How do I use them? When do I use them? Well, modes are one of the things that the pros use to add excitement and colour to their guitar parts, and there is no reason why you can't use them too. Now, for some reason, people, especially certain online guitar teachers, love to make modes seem complicated and scary, but I'm here to tell you they really, really aren't. And in fact, if you know the pentatonic scale, I can show you how to play modes with just two extra notes. In this course, I'll show you how to play killer sounding guitar solos using modes without any of the mystery. You'll learn how to play musical sounding solos all across the neck in any key, crucially without sounding like you're just running up and down scales. So, if you're ready to take this next step with me, click the link to find out more. So there you go, guys. That's a look at Mastery Modes Part 1. If you're sat going, geez, wow, I didn't know there was so much beyond the pentatonic scale, that's the course for you. Really, really good entry-level course, but there is some great stuff in there, I think, for uh, players who are a bit more au fait with this stuff, especially if you found yourself doing the thing that so many players do, where you're able to uh, phrase in the pentatonic scale and sound like you're making music and doing you know, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> It's really hard not to play the intro to Cliffs of Dover there. You don't even play these two notes. We're not going to do that today. We'll get copyright struck. Um, I'm sure, maybe not. Maybe we won't play it very well and we won't, but even still. You're able to play music with the pentatonic scale, but when it's time to play modes, you go, oh yeah, I know that shape. And suddenly we're playing 
a scale and not some music. Not to say the scales on their own aren't musical devices, but we all know what we're talking about, right? That typewriter syndrome where you go to the end of the scale and go, start here, finish here, right? Even if you actually know quite a lot about what you're talking about with this stuff, that course is going to be useful for you because of the way it's presented, I guess. So we've got some cool suggestions, some cool questions coming in. First one, Sacred God Slayer says, uh, next lesson, augmented scales in blues. Don't know if we've got a full stream on that, but maybe we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll touch on it. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, Daryl Queen's got a great question uh, on this. This is a very, very good one. It says, uh, we obviously mentioned Robin Ford. Do you have any other players you feel a good entry-level listening for these altered, diminished, and outside sounds? I do. I absolutely do. We've got some good suggestions, too. Uh, he's saying somewhere between, say, Robin Ford on one end of the spectrum and Scott Henderson and Holdsworth on the further end. I wouldn't call Robin Ford one end of the spectrum, for sure. I would say Robin Ford... Uh, is is still pretty far down that spectrum. Um, but I know what you mean. Uh, I guess, uh, I mean, a real favourite is Josh Smith. Um, he's just, like, superb at this stuff. Uh, somebody's just mentioned Matt Schofield. Another really good shout. So Matt Schofield's a really good one. Um, probably wouldn't go so far as John Schofield. Um, but... I mean, do, by all means. Uh, Mike Stern has a bunch of really cool stuff like this because he still has that rock touch um, going on. He's not quite in the Holdsworth camp, let's say. I guess Scott Henderson is probably uh, a really good shout for for having that blues thing in his playing still and seeing how that kind of blends across. Uh, Nick's Corsair S1 tips are some good shouts for sure. Uh, Larry Cartland, Lee Rittner, um... That's very cool. Um, we like a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Robin Ford uh, has the right blend between traditional blues and a touch of outplaying. Yeah, you know, there's a reason we bring Robin Ford's name up on this, because Robin still sounds like a man playing the blues. Uh, yeah, Larry Carton's a really good shout. If you want to sort of delve into it in more of a rock kind of context, I really like Ian Thornley for this stuff. Um, now, you might not think of the almighty Thornicus uh, as a guy you know, who he does a lot of this sort of stuff, but he watches improvisations. Uh, let's say you can really hear these things coming out when stuff gets a bit sour. Uh, let's say, so Thornley's a really good shout. Um, don't want to hear much of blues. He doesn't play a whole lot of blues stuff. Um, but you will hear, he plays with a, a blue sensibility from time to time, but he doesn't play over 12 bars that often. So, uh, yes, Ian is a monster, says Response Audio. He's one of my favorite guitar players. I love Ian Thornley. Uh, we sometimes hear a bit of it in Richie Cotton's playing as well. Um, so these are guys who are like, uh, they're very educated guitar players, but they have that thing where they go, yeah, but I still want to play soul or blues or rock or whatever pop music who knows um so there's some good shouts uh a point from andreas grunwald that i want to agree with and disagree with um it's i guess difficult for beginners learning scales without any harmonic contents every note should be spelled its position might be mentioned by fret and string i actually don't think it's that useful um for beginners to have every note spelled as the first point of contact. I actually think it overcomplicates things. Um, and the example that I use, I think you should absolutely learn the spellings of this stuff, um, but I think it should come after you've played it for a second. Uh, and I think shape can be useful for this. Um, let's say, the reason I say this is because, in my opinion, the most important thing to, um, when it comes to learning a concept like this is to, is to hear it. So you need to be able to, to identify the sound first because we have an incredible ability to self-correct on the guitar based on sound. So if we hear something and we're producing the sound we expect it to, we have this positive reinforcement. If we produce a sound, we go, oh, that's not the right note. If we know that because we've listened to it and we've heard the sound, then we have an astonishing ability to self-correct. Now, the spelling is very important because we start to get into application with that. I totally agree with you um, that it is an important thing to do, but I think it's a mistake to say people should learn that first. I'm not, I don't think you're actually saying that, but I think a lot of people do suggest that. They say, oh, you should learn the, the spelling of the scale first. I actually don't think that's terribly useful to begin with. There's a whole litany of reasons why, um, one of which is um, the... Uh, I'm going to get really into the weeds here, but it's the the nature of the guitar as a grid instrument and as a 
somewhere between the voice which exists on a continuum of pitches relative to a home key and the piano which exists as discrete musical units with individual names that we can easily recall um, for example if you take a singer who doesn't have perfect pitch and say to them because that's most singers say sing me the third of E what? say to a piano player playing with the third of E boom there it is say to a singer sing me the third of this note they'll be able to find it pretty easily if they're a decent singer. Say to a piano player, playing with a third of this note, they'll have to find out what that note is first, and then they'll have to find out what the other note is called, which is G sharp. We know what, what's the third of E, it's G sharp. Bong, there it is. If you say to a guitar player, playing with a third of this note, they would have to find that pitch, but then they'd have to locate a shape for the third, rather than a name and the name would come second. So that's one of the reasons. The big reason though, I think, is that it's barriers to immediately making music with something. And we want to remove barriers to immediately grappling with the concept um, because by immediately grappling with the concept musically, you get to hear it and you get to hear it with you making the noise. You don't have to listen to somebody else doing it. You get to hear it and associate it with places where you can play the thing. And once you have that, it's really easy to go back and learn the spellings and learn the context. So while I absolutely agree this stuff should all be set in musical context, I think that's a very important semantic point that I wanted to bring up. I didn't just want to go off a rant on there, but there's there's some, some deeper thoughts here, I guess. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, kind of in a nutshell, that's it. And this kind of comes from me being uh, teaching theory to guitar players and also teaching theory um, to singers. Uh, now, teaching theory to singers, singers get taught theory like piano players. And there has never been a more inappropriate teaching method than teaching the w teaching theory the way you teach a piano player to a singer because they interface with the world in a very different way um, or interface with music in a very different way um, and the guitar is somewhere in between the two in the way that we conceptualize music um, so yeah there you go wow how did we get onto that oh here's a great point from my friend Craig uh, says I think you need uh, the sound first through listening to the music play uh, what you like by practicing what you need yeah totally agree Totally, totally agree. Um, I guess it's a little bit like the reading music thing. Um, we're getting off in the next soapbox corner now. But the reading music thing is another interesting thing. Um, because for some instruments, reading music is a very, very handy shorthand that just sort of shows you exactly what's playing where. But for other instruments, it's like reading in a second language. Um, and oftentimes, the reading thing gets put before the playing when that's not something you do in any other language let's say you would never say for example if you're teaching electronics you would never show the symbols before you describe the concept uh, and you would never write down the word for a baby and say let's say you want the word your questions answered you would never teach a baby to say this by by pointing at the word and going read this baby baby doesn't know you would teach it to speak by saying your questions questions a bit hard but you get the idea you would teach it to grapple with the word first and then you would contextualize it and then finally we learn the hieroglyphics that enable us to recall it and communicate it over the internet wow soapbox time so anyway listen i'm happy that i could get some of that stuff off my chest because uh i always love talking about that stuff in the meantime thank you very much for having me my name is nick jennison from guitar interactive gi plus i realized today was quite a theory dense session but don't worry you can replay this stuff at your leisure i think you're going to get some good stuff out of it in the meantime in the meantime if you haven't done so already if you're watching us on youtube give us a subscribe it really does help it helps an awful lot also you can go to this url down below guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash gi hyphen plus that's the word p-l-u-s where you'll find more lessons on all manner of stuff including but not limited to the stuff that we did today loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff in the meantime thank you very much for having me my name is nick jennison for guitar interactive gi plus i'm gonna throw the gain on and we're gonna gary moore well maybe not gary gary moore or less uh over this guy i'll see you guys next week thank you very much for having me uh See you next week. It's going to be some more blues, but something different. In the meantime, see you in a wee bit.
fun see you guys like uh, next week in the meantime check this out this is what you get as part of your gi plus membership my name is nick jennison and it's a pleasure to introduce to you gi plus the brand new lesson platform brought to you by guitar interactive We've assembled a team of the best players and educators in the world to bring you exclusive lessons covering everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Or maybe Country's more your bag? Well, how about a full-length exclusive country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Or perhaps you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 60 feature-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmore, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Tosin Abbasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. You get all this along with exclusive live webinars, free backing tracks, competitions, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for GI Plus today.